So, thanks for the opportunity to come and share some of the work that I've been uh, doing for up to some time on uh, trying to maintain some memory of what research went on. Uh, we'll be going through uh, most of the um, ideas that have been presented uh, previously. Virtualization as a way of storing the state. Um, nice, rich environment for storing notebooks and so on. I think one of the things which is just a bit different from what has been previously stressed is that I would understand um, reproducible research, not necessarily in the sense of just reproducing research code results, but trying to reproduce the research experience also in the sense of thinking up ideas, documenting the ideas, perhaps uh, documenting the publication process, and little tidbits of knowledge that we acquire along the way. So uh, these are some of the ideas that will come about here. Uh, I'm sure they're not half-baked ideas because they're fully baked. I come from North Carolina. I left 101 degrees to cool down for a week, which is very nice. So thanks again for the opportunity to be here. So I'll uh, first uh, start with uh, some motivation and um, some discussion of um, lots of previous attempts on archiving um, research in the computational sciences. And that will kind of lead to one possible solution which uh, uses virtualization. This is not meant to be general in any way. It's really a personal perspective. I think the one thing that is general is in the desire for any tools that are brought about to reflect the capabilities of what I found out by experimentation and trying various things. So as a prologue, um, I was looking for a reproducible research experience, so I look at the oldest archives I have. Actually, about 15 years ago, almost to the day, I was um, doing something that had to do with um, Godnoff methods, Riemann solvers, just like Jim was talking about previously. So you see here is a listing of a directory from 1996. It's July 14th, not 15th, but close enough for a 15-year thing. And I'm on the um, scatterbrained end of the spectrum, so I do a lot of things. I never uh, finish everything before trying to do yet one more little thing that I find interesting. And that got me so upset that I wanted to uh, force myself to document what I was doing. At the time, one of the things which was interesting was this letter programming uh, framework, which was put forward by um, Doc Knut. And for Fortran, there was this uh, nice FWeb variant. And uh, looking at the um, listing, uh, you can't see the endings of these files, but there's web things that are there. So this is a way of combining LaTeX documentation, uh, C, Fortran code, whatever language you have. At the time, it was nice to have this in available in an interactive framework. So actually, this is something which was meant to um, go into Mat MATLAB through the MEX facility. So that's nice. Experiment, can I reproduce what was happening 15 years ago, best attempt with what were arguably the best tools available at the time to get the same results? Um, so first thing I notice is that there's a make file in the directory, so I say yes. I do not have to remember what the commands were because those go out immediately. Um, then you go through uh, the list of requirements, which you, it's a good idea to map out for yourself because I don't know about you, but I will forget after a couple of weeks. And uh, you go through and you say, well, what, the Whatcom 10.0 compiler. Um, I would imagine that there are relatively few people who know what that is. Uh, interestingly enough, it's still available. It's one of these commercial things that has been put in the public domain. You can really date yourself if, if you can identify this particular switch on the compilation line. So. Uh, Randy, you cannot answer, but anybody else want to venture? <laughs> that means use the 80287 coprocessor for numerical work, which was a very expensive option to the IBM PCs and XTs that we had at the time. So, um, okay, C is C, maybe that works out. Uh, there was stuff in there that had to use F to C, F web tech. That should be really no problem. These are very stable systems. Uh, there's one big problem. There was a 4.0 MATLAB requirement, and I know of no way of getting that outside of contacting Cleve directly because it's not around anywhere. There is a free MATLAB 1.0, but that's it. 
that you can get, which is in the public domain. They haven't been good about any of the other variants. So uh, with that in mind, uh, doesn't look very promising, but maybe not completely hopeless either. You uh, look at the tools and you say, can I get my environment to be back the way it was? The public tools, they can stick around. You have a bit more luck. So if you just go into a package manager, such as the Synaptic Package Manager and Ubuntu, which I use, do a search for FWeb, lo and behold, it's there. Tag it, download it. As I mentioned, proprietary tools, if you're lucky and you have somebody in a generous frame of mind, they'll put it in the public domain more often than not. They won't. But um, let me redo this experiment with you. And um, let's try it. So go out of uh, presentation mode for a while. And here's a shell. Copy what was in 1996. Everything old is new again. Go into that. And if we look at what we have here, we're going to um, say, well, maybe I can make the documentation directly. Yuck. That happens because it was under DOS. You have the carriage line, find, uh, line feed tab conventions. So the make file does not go directly. Fine. Um, forget about that. Can I um, get the um, tech file by emitting the weave command? Yeah, that works. Fweave works. Fweave is meant to take this web description of a program and give you a tech file. And then you can uh, look at it and see if you can compile the tech. Um, prog.tech is what you want, so try to compile that. Um, no, that really didn't work. It's missing some dependencies of some macros that I had along. So that didn't do such a good job for me. You can try to um, get the source code. This is something which is called Tangle in the literate way of doing things. So um, can't open prob. Well, that's my mistake from now, sorry. There we go. That's a program. And that actually worked, and we get the thing right back. A nice Fortran code. So I'm in business. I can actually just, well, it's Fortran 77 at that time. And I can compile it. Of course, it will work. Um, no. If you go to it, the reason it doesn't work is that the weave processor used some macro substitutions. The macro substitutions introduce some carriage line feeds. You get the general idea. Um, it was a nice thing. Though, if you actually look at what you had to write, this is what you wrote. You wrote blocks of code, and there were these little magical at some things that then showed you that you had things that were macros, like data that had to be substituted somewhere along the way, or LaTeX markup, and so on. Not very friendly in the grand scheme of things. So what um, do you learn from that? Things change. Um, so quingentianus um, abnicus auditas mihi diversus. That's 500 years ago. You've heard me speaking a bit differently. Uh, anybody care to venture a guess as to what's in the picture on the right-hand side? That's right. But that's the way we do it nowadays. You can divide the difference interpolation polynomial. So you can recognize a couple of things. Latin, geometric language, because that's the way mathematics was done at the time, that sort of thing. So the lesson that you really learn is that um, all to the contrary of what people might say, we're actually practicing a social endeavor that depends on our environment. And everything that we do is a product of uh, the time that we are in. And if you're a historian, maybe you can find pleasure in deciphering all of this. You can see how human knowledge has evolved along the centuries and so on. But I don't think it would be very fair to send this to a colleague or to a student and say, yeah, figure it out what I meant in that particular language at that time. So what's going on here is the necessity of storing the context that you're in. 
Now, this is something which has been recognized in programming and computer science for a bit of time. Uh, Lazo Church is this idea of lambda calculus, calculus that every expression that you would write is a valuable, calculable as it was named at the time, and also that did not introduce any side effects. Now, if you um, are a big fan of Lisp and try programming it, it's a very nice aesthetic language. There are very few things, though, which are part of regular research software that are programmed in Lisp. Maxima is probably the biggest one out there, which is clearly fully done in Lisp. Most of us prefer imperative languages. And the big thing is that imperative languages, by their very design, have side effects. Now, what does this mean? It means that unless you capture the context, meaning the full history, you cannot actually reproduce exactly what you have. So you use imperative coding, so then you are forced to the necessity of storing the context, storing the state. With that theoretical backdrop, of course, what we should do is something that has been discussed quite a bit, namely we should store everything if you really want to reproduce this. And you would get compilers, everything for free, and you could also get things restored, and you would restore the compiler versions and so on. And one thing which is very important to restore is the particularities of the environment that you develop for your own research code. So if you uh, go and download Randy's Claw Pack, uh, you have to set an environment variable, you have to do it through export, and try to do that with students, and what the heck is export is more often than not the first question that, and why do I need to do this, and what does it have to do with anything? So it would be nice to have all of that hidden away in some way. Um, so what are the pros and cons? There are things which have been mentioned. Uh, I guess I'd like to highlight this on the uh, plus side a bit more. Um, one of the things which is very important nowadays is that we've kind of fixed on this processor architecture in many ways, that almost everything is the same from the point of view of the processor architecture. And it has virtualization bit, which actually provides for virtualization support. That's why the things actually work very fast. You only lose about 5% versus the native speed of the machine. And because of this, you can switch contexts and still save the entire context that you're in and switch between them. So the nice thing about this is that you know, it acts like a time machine. Uh, I mentioned here that um, Turbo Pascal was popular in the late 80s, 5.5 uh, at the time. It was quite the thing. And uh, the thing still runs. I mean, you can go launch a nice DOS emulator. It runs. You go to where you install Borland Pascal because they've put it in the public domain under the title of Antique Software. Since I did a lot of work in that, it made me really feel nice to hear that title. But you look at that and you say, okay, well, well what do we have here? There is um, some code. Interestingly enough, it happens to be exactly what uh, Jim presented uh, previously, though we did not talk. It's Shockwave and looking at Lax Landroff and so on. So you can go and um, launch the thing. And lo and behold, you get this very nice and familiar environment. It's lightning fast and it works even after all this time due to the beauty of recreating the DOS box environment. If you try to run, yeah, that didn't work out so well. If they would have put Turbo 6.0 in the public domain, it would have been fine. But at that time, they did not know how to pass names of routines as arguments. And I'm passing McCormick, the algorithm, as an argument in order to compare McCormick with Godinov and so on. But what is interesting, though, is that if you go out and launch the executable from then, yeah, it still works. It's a lousy numerical scheme, you get all these oscillations, but the simulation is still there. So really on the um, plus side of things, this idea that you could actually, for an appreciable amount of time, get the code run with minimal effort and look at the code and have things like utilities compiler still work is very nice. We know the uh, downside, large amount of data, what guarantees that VM emulators will be around and so on. And I think the only uh, really uh, worrisome is this one, the second, whether VM emulators will still be around in 10, 15 years, let's say.
to that end, I would argue that it is really part of the community to say to the funding agencies and the um, journals that, well, maybe you should propose one particular virtual machine emulator that will be publicly supported by all these funds so that we have a common reference frame and don't really rely on the good graces of Oracle putting something in the public domain, which is rather rare given what Oracle usually does on the business side of things or VMware putting something in the public domain. And if you really think about it, um, by comparison to researcher time, which is the most important thing, uh, storage is cheap and you do have all sorts of um, advantages in terms of um, being able to support very complicated environments. The, um, let's see if I can get this to show fully. Yeah, that, that might be a bit better. Uh, interestingly enough, you can do things like um, parallel computing, even uh, pass through to underlying um, CUDA hardware is possible. So if you uh, go that route, then the nice thing is that there's no limit to how you use it, whatever your workflow, this has been mentioned just in the previous talks, uh, you would just store it, document it, whatever you would like to do. And you can store states, you can store forks of the um, basic machine for various uh, interesting hardware that you'd like to support, for instance. And the nice thing from the point of view of especially an academic environment is that you can preset the environment and if you give something to a student, it really becomes click here because everything has been opened up and scrolled down to exactly where he would need to or she would need to work at that particular time for that particular homework assignment. So what I will be presenting is the peculiarities of getting one of these environments together with the needs of the academic environment in mind mostly. And I will uh, talk about uh, one um, particular virtual machine, the UNC virtual machine that I've been testing out uh, for about five years now in various classes. If you look at the um, restrictions, they have to do with policy more often than not in terms of um, what computational resources are available to various people at various stages in their training. Uh, incoming freshmen are required at UNC, for instance, to have a laptop. It has to have these minimum requirements. Among the minimum requirements, you can see that it has to have Microsoft Windows. That's actually needed for a lot of things in the, the context of other coursework. So that's great. This is what's coming in the pipeline. Perhaps you would be interested somewhere in the future to produce people who would actually work on a research cluster, such as the research clusters we have at UNC. These are fairly powerful machines, and you look at it and you say, yes, they all use Linux. They all require some familiarity with that. If you want, you can take a crash course in Linux and learn things. So there's a bit of a problem in getting from here to there if you look at the um, things which are set by policy. So what do you do to um, guide that transition if you're interested in both computational science results and computational science training as is part of the mission for anybody in an academic environment. Um, you, of course, advocate for more research-friendly platforms, so OS 10, Ubuntu sent us all these things which are Unix-like. Uh, we actually got that done after about five years and we have a localized Linux variant, Tar Heel Linux, which is nice, but the way that this works out is that it's one click install that erases everything that you have and people don't want to give up on the um, window environment, they still need that. Of course, the more interesting thing to do is to ensure a bit more flexibility for your own co coursework and um, get one of these virtual machines together. So what I will uh, talk about in um, the next 30 minutes or so will be the peculiarities of what this virtual machine looks like and why it's interesting for reproducible research in the context of what by trial and error seems to work in this context and which would be nice if anybody's thinking of tools and so on to uh, have these features available. Um, starts from some standard uh, distribution, lightweight Ubuntu is nice because it doesn't take so much in the way of resources. It has a bunch of uh, free software things. I think the 
first uh, bullet point here is probably familiar to most everybody. Um, TechMax, I found this probably not known. I'm actually curious if anybody knows of it here, outside of Lauren, of course, who went through UNC. <laughs> um, so it's nice because it's a container, and containers will serve an interesting um, center point in the presentation, much as um, Amrita uh, played that role in what Jim was talking just previously. And the machine has some variants. If you are interested in hardware, you can actually do um, MPI OpenMP by having multiple processors. There's been some recent work which is quite interesting in uh, actually getting accessibility of an underlying GPU, which is available on the host machine through the Arcuda uh, software. This is a program out of the University of Valencia in Spain. And that actually um, is nice and also is in one of the forks of the project. And you can also add on um, various in-house bits of code. Uh, I'll be talking about um, a PDE solver, Bearclaw, and um, another thing which actually is the way that I did the presentation. I, I love Beamer. I don't like all the markup, so if you prefer Python sparsity, this slide was generated by the code on the um, right but through the yaml to tech facility, essentially kind of a super markup, as it were. So, um, practical examples. So can, I, can I ask your, your target audience here, are the students in those two courses? No, my target audience is the academic environment, but I'll be talking about courses, one undergraduate, one graduate, and then I'll be talking about, after that, the research environment itself. But the academic environment is the main uh, focus, and as we'll see, one of the things which is important in that environment is what has been mentioned a number of times, really uh, getting into a modern framework, what we mean by a lab notebook. So um, here are the um, ca uh, case studies I'll be presenting. I'll be talking a bit about two courses and um, some research project, which is really a current research project. Uh, let's start with the um, undergraduate introductory numerical analysis in which people come in, they've gone through a couple of years of college, they're typically um, juniors, they've had a compulsory coding class in their freshman year, first semester. My first question is, can you write the code that counts to 10? And in a class of 50, I find that the number who can actually do that is substantially less than 10. So you really have to bring back to everybody what it means to code. Um, we're just too familiar nowadays from the point of view of the environment with point and click and everything's done for you by some programmers. You never have to do something for yourself. So you don't want to scare people off. So a rather friendly environment would be um, rather nice uh, for all of this. Now, this is going to be a hands-on introduction, so um, here's my machine manager, right? And I will uh, now start the thing up. That's typically in the way that it would be started up from a snapshot prior to one week uh, of classes. The nice thing being that um, as I said, the state is, served, uh, is safe, so if you just are in the second week of classes and you're looking at what you should have done in homework one, that's your solution. Um, this is TechMax. It's, um, as you look at it, you might say it's some kind of DVI type utility. It's actually an editor, um, one of these editors in which you can add math and text and so on in rather easy fashion. <laughs> The environment is rich, and it's interesting, of course, because you can get immediate visual feedback, which you can get in LaTeX also after a bit of time, but it's better to perhaps use natural mathematical language, especially if you're in a teaching environment. Uh, as you can figure out, the uh, order of the day is polynomial interpolation, and the problems have to do with various things that you have to do with polynomial interpolation. Now, one of the things that um, Jim was mentioning and that I also um, find very appealing is the idea of a container, a place in which you can put documentation, explanation, 
but also code, executing code. One of the things which is very nice about TechMac, and it's freeware, is that you can insert sessions from various other kinds of environments. You have a listing of environments here, uh, GNUplot, Maximum, Octave, and so on, Python. And all of these can be made to work in parallel with the writing up of what you're doing. So if you're interested in comparing how well the, um, I guess, cubic truncation from the Taylor series approximation of sine of x works as an approximation procedure, you can um, try that out. And after a bit of loading of new plot, you get those plots right back into your presentation, your homework assignment, which you would just print out. You can, of course, fiddle around with things and change. And at the end of the day, you get a worse approximation. But the important thing from the point of view of reproducible research in the sense of reproducible research learning, reproducible research um, experience in terms of uh, looking at science is the immediacy of having what you're doing in terms of the theory and what you're doing in terms of the implementation of the theory right next to one another, each in its own specific, most naturally expressed language, the language of mathematics as immediately typeset and the coding as shown here. Um, this is very similar to other systems that are uh, out there. Uh, the SAGE uh, program at the University of Washington tried to integrate all these things and to one package. They um, did a lot of effort initially just to get things to work and then using Python as a glue. And then the whole idea of worksheets came about as a necessity to make things work. It still does, it's very nice, but it still doesn't work in quite the same satisfying uh, way that um, the TechMac environment actually is. You can uh, combine simple plotting with things that have to do with uh, symbolic computation. Maxim is available. So you know, define a function, look for its Taylor series. If you uh, don't believe me that this is actually uh, something which, well, I shouldn't put it in the output. I should put it in the input, of course. But we can change that and do a Taylor series and get another Taylor expansion. So there's actual computation going on there. <laughs> Tech max. Uh, you know, it's being developed by an active researcher who, like all active researchers, has very little time for documentation. But a new version is coming out every two to three months. <laughs> no, um, there is a main developer who still maintains a relatively centralized degree of control of what gets integrated into a package, into the main distribution package. But he's very open to suggestions, and there are about, I think, a dozen or so people who contribute regularly, and a lot more on an ad hoc basis. And the user community is strong, not in the US. It's a European thing. So it's, it's very popular in, um, in Europe. Um, so that's nice. It means that uh, students are especially pleased at this stage because they can compute those remainder formulas from polynomial interpolation without having to do all the differentiations by themselves. It makes them very happy. Um, you can immediately start teaching things like interaction of various software packages one with another. Load up the Fortran 90 module from Maxima and you can get what is Fortran 90 code for any analytic expression. C code also works and so on. And as you can imagine, this gets essentially as complicated and as involved as you like from the point of view of what you want to present. You have more new plot. The other thing is that um, Python is supported. Once you've supported Python, that basically means you can do anything you want. So um, computations that um, you would do in Python, like evaluating that table of how good the interpolation is, is right there. That actually executed. Again, if you um, need some proof of the fact that this is actually executing code, change something and it updates and so on. 
more of um, the Maxima framework and so on. And the nice thing is that you get to introduce things in a piecemeal fashion. Uh, if you've ever used literate programming, one of the ideas there is to break down programs into little pieces that are digestible. The um, successive Python sessions all are in the same environment. So once I define something, I can comment why I did it this way, what particular mathematics I'm applying, what particular implementation ideas I have, and they're stored in the memory and I can then come back into the Python environment and use them as is being done here to set up um, a whole sequence of procedures to evaluate the error of the um, Newton interpolant. And I won't go through any of this anymore. You, uh, you get the general idea of uh, what is interesting from the point of view of the um, undergraduate experience. Now, if you go to um, things that Lauren remembers either fondly or not. <laughs> um, at graduate level, the nice thing is that you can really work things out in detail. For instance, if you want to present caloric and finite elements and want to exemplify this on a second order differential equation, trilinear piecewise, um, that's what you have to do. This is one of the homeworks. It's a two week homework, keeps them busy. Um, you would what does a linear interpolant look like? Put some new plot things in there. That's what it should look like. But that's rather on the trivial side of things. However, one of the things that is nice is that the complexity just builds. And if you want now to do the assembly of the finite element matrix, you know, you have to compute all these integrals of various derivatives of the uh, interpolating function. And derivatives of the interpolating functions are, but then of course you can also use this uh, very nice um, mathematical input to Maxima, which is one of the things which is available there, to compute uh, what are known as the elemental integrals that would be combined in order to form the stiffness matrix if this was elasticity. So getting together a um, analytical formulation, all documented because this is in the document, right? of what your uh, matrix looks like is fairly straightforward. You can, of course, put that in nice form if you want through uh, basic writing out of matrices and diagonal form and so on. And then, of course, you'd be interested in um, stability properties. You can play around with eigenvalues, that sort of thing. I'll just skip to one more feature, and that is implementations. Uh, you've put together your matrix. You've made some arguments as to why it's positive definite. We put forward a um, reduced LU decomposition, a Thompson solver for why you would solve it this way because it's fast. And then you can write some pseudocode and then go directly to an implementation which is in Fortran. This is now a um, routine which lives on disk. Uh, it's just being included here, it's included in dynamic fashion. Anything that uh, updates the routine I can uh, see in the document. And since you have a Python at your disposal, you can now enrich your Python environment. Take that Fortran subroutine, pass it through F2Py, you've just extended your Python environment with something that computes the rigidity matrix and then solves it. And you can go through and um, work this out, uh, append the current path to your Python environment from Cholsky, import that, and then in this particular range, call that routine for P going 5, 6, all the way to 10, thereby setting up a convergence study. You can get these errors. That's where I wrote the data from my, Python, from my Fortran routine, I think. And that's what gets output. And then, of course, if you um, really want to do things, you can um, try to see what the um, convergence plot looks like. There's these least squares fits, which are available at new plot which you can actually um, use, and they spit out slopes that you can compare with a theoretical estimate and also a plot of um, log coordinates of the convergence plot and so on. So at this point, the interesting thing is not only that I reproduced the results from then, that, that was nice, but I also reproduced the entire thought process of teaching the method, what was going on, and everything that had to do with the details, both theoretical and um, 
from the point of view of the coding itself. Finally, as a um, last example, let me um, switch to research per se, not necessarily teaching about methods. So um, going from this idea of what you want to teach at the graduate level, let me just briefly also finish up on the idea of how to use this in a research environment. Um, I started with uh, Randy a bit of time ago working on this general PD solver. It's per It's a fork, essentially, of the claw pack. It has various features for solving PDEs. And it's interesting to use this in applications. Um, one current application I'm working on is to design better solar cells by biomimic techniques. Butterflies are very black or very iridescent, not because of anything to do with the electronic st structure of the chemicals, but rather because in cross-section their wings have this appearance here that leads to um, interdicted bands, their so-called photo photonic crystals. And we're trying to reproduce this in um, manufacturing framework. So if you uh, want to use the um, geometry there as inspiration, what you do uh, from the point of view of research is to com come up with some computational package to, um, or computational routine to solve the uh, Maxwell equations in order to be able to figure out the intensity of light in various portions of this structure like this. It, the intensity of light is something which is going to be essentially linked to the number of charges that get generated. That's the physics of the thing. Um, so you can present results. Uh, this should be an animation, which uh, I'll show in a bit. But even if you would imagine the imagine, uh, animation, which I'll show in a, a second or so, just saying that I've solved the Maxwell equations in the time domain using an auxiliary equation for dispersive media, that's OK. It's kind of a description, but it's not really telling you what you did. It would be uh, much better if you would actually show this in a bit more detail. So if I go to um, the current working directory where all of this stuff is being presented, then starting up again the TextMac environment, I have documentation, which is now documentation for an application in a literate programming way, but which contains uh, full math. And also, you can add on little macros that say, well, if I click here, an editor automatically comes up, and I can um, change things around. That's my new value. Um, save that. Um, once you've saved that, you have the document with the most recent uh, values. The thing goes on and on, and you update the graphs that are along the way. And you're able, by this means, to fully document all of your input files, include all of your uh, Fortran code, and so on. And since you can always fall back to what's going on in Python. You essentially would document exactly each step that goes along the way. So the nice thing I find about this, which has um, been mentioned a number of times, but perhaps not with the focus on keeping the lab notebook as rich as it should be. I mean, if you look at a lab notebook, it's a blank page with the limits only set by our imagination. And you would really like containers that would show what the research experience is to somehow mimic this environment if you don't like this one. Rich mathematical notation, possibility of scripting, possibility of controlling computations through Python. You can launch things on a cluster and so on. So uh, with that, I will um, close just with um, a few uh, final thoughts. It's nice to um, reproduce and archive the entire environment. And for me, uh, the one mot motivation, like I said, I'm rarely remember what I was doing a few months ago. But if you get into the habit of writing as you code, then it's a bit easier on the recall function after a bit of time passes by. So with that, um, thanks for your attention. It's literal programming 
um, by accident, <laughs> not, by de not by design. So TechMax started off as um, essentially a more user-friendly way of inputting LaTeX. But once the scripting facility came in, people got to appreciate a nice lab notebook. And, and so the, the advantage of putting that into a VM is that all those all the support software for the containers. Yes, and all the settings work, and uh, everything is just tuned. How big is that VM? Um, so the VM I typically design uses one gig of memory, 128 megabytes of video RAM. Uh, 16 gig maximum disk when it's um, distributed, it's about six gigs, six gigabytes. Yeah. Are you doing your day to day development in this VM? Yeah. Yeah. So I I use version management, which is a sort of version, to actually store the entire thing. One of the things which would be nice is to have some kind of diff <laughs> thing so that you don't have to store the thing. But um, like I said, storage is cheap. At the end of the day update whatever you have, go home, it's there if you need to go back. Yeah. Do you notice this, uh, any significant degradation in the speed of the code? Uh, like I said, the typical penalty that you pay by comparison of running on the machine is um, about 10%, 15%. That's by timing. You don't really notice it. No. Especially if you know, it depends on what end of the scale you're on. If you're developing methods and most of the time you're thinking about ideas, it, I mean, you didn't no, see I'm it. No, I'm thinking it as a, a heavy-duty code like bear claw. Um, when the computations get big, bigger than, let's say, 128 by 128 grid, what happens is that um, there is a script that launches the computation somewhere else and brings back a graph of the results. So you don't see it. You launch it and wait for the remote computational server uh, to do it. But you're asking just if you're running a big uh, four pan code or something yeah. in a VM versus running yeah. it native on your yeah. hardware? Yeah. yeah. It's, I think it depends a bit, but I, as Soren says, I think you don't see too much of it. Yeah. Some of my students even ran into cases where I ran faster in the VM than yeah. they did on the native. <laughs> 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 I mean, if it's just doing computation, it shouldn't slow down at all. No. If anything can be faster, like you said, it gets it to be a Yeah, but it's the thing to slow down the system calls. So if you're hitting a lot of disk accesses, for example, that might slow down. How could it be faster? Um, I don't know. It could be magical. Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> On, on, on the host machine, you run it in debug mode, and on the VMware, <laughs> <laughs> optimized <laughs> mode. <laughs> I don't think it's exist as long as we're green. You can do sort of just in time compilation on the, on the data itself, which wasn't available in the old version. So you just do it. Like you're passing my code to the. Uh, anyway. I don't think this will exist, but it's, but it's conceivable you could actually be faster. Okay. Sure. Questions? My homework's never looked at this. <laughs> <laughs> so do you get the students to hand in their homeworks? Yeah, I, I can show one.